I would like to greet you all here uh, at this virtual panel discussion hosted by the European Policy Institute. And um, I would just like uh, uh, to say a few words of welcome on behalf of uh, the European Policy Institute. Uh, I'm not going to elaborate uh, a lot about the importance of uh, the regional cooperation topic. Um, I would just say that our interest uh, is uh, practically since um, the establishment of our uh, institute, now almost 10 years ago. And um, we have not only uh, demonstrated uh, interest and worked uh, on the topic, but uh, we have actively participated in the creation of uh, regional uh, networks. Um, now, uh, the, in the last um, several uh, months, apart from the standard enlargement package that uh, came in uh, October, was late, um, there were a couple of um, other interesting, um, <clears throat> let's say, not events, but uh, maybe uh, opportunities to discuss uh, the topics, such as the paper uh, by uh, the uh, Vienna Institute uh, for International Economic uh, Studies that um, has um, really drawn attention. Um, the paper is pushing on a string, an evaluation of regional economic cooperation in the Western Balkans. And we thought that it would be quite uh, useful now uh, to, um, uh, again, um, highlight the topic of Western Balkan regional economic cooperation, of course, uh, looking forward, um, but um, in order to look forward, we have to see where we stand uh, now. Um, since uh, the word I, I mentioned, noted the word Vienna Institute for International Economic Studies, uh, I simply cannot uh, uh, um, not uh, express our solidarity and I, behalf, uh, I speak here, uh, I believe on behalf of all the participants in this um, virtual panel discussion, solidarity with the citizens of uh, Vienna, uh, the beautiful city we all love after the uh, Vienna terrorist uh, attack a couple of days ago. Uh, now I would like to shortly present the speakers and then we shall uh, go forward with the presentation of uh, the study. Uh, Dr. Richard Griffson is the Deputy Director at the Vienna Institute for International Economic Studies and he specializes in the economies of Central, East and Southeastern Europe with a particular focus on Turkey and the Western Balkans. Our discussants uh, today uh, Dr. Sivana Moisovska, she is a professor at the Institute of uh, Economics in Skopje and was uh, engaged in research at the London School of Economics. She is an author of numerous studies uh, related to regional cooperation in the Balkans and EU integration. Uh, Mr. Dusan Relich uh, is the head of the Brussels office of SWP Berlin, the German Institute for International and Security Affairs. He previously worked as senior research uh, associate in this institute in the division of EU external relations after a long and successful career as a journalist. Uh, his areas are international relations, security, focus on EU enlargement in Southeast uh, Europe, issues of transition, democratization, nationalism, political communication and media. Uh, we have with us uh, today also Ms. Maya Hanjiska Trendafilova who is the head of the program department of the Regional Cooperation Council. Uh, she started her career in the Secretariat for European Affairs uh, and uh, continued a uh, very sex successful uh, career in the Macedonian uh, diplomacy in the missions at, uh, mission at AU in Brussels uh, before joining the uh, Regional uh, Cooperation uh, Council. Um, these were my short uh, presentations. I believe today we have also um, an uh, introductory presentation and um, we have discussants uh, that are highly quali qualified and very willing to discuss uh, this topic. Uh, so I believe this, that we shall have a very interesting uh, discussion. Um, I think 
I spent my uh, five minutes in a very rational uh, way, so I would uh, now um, give uh, the word uh, to Mr. Richard Griffson uh, just to mention again that the Vienna Institute has been practically the most prominent economic analyst of the Balkans transition. Um, and now we are uh, referring to your most recent study, which doesn't seem overly optimistic about the economic prospects of the Balkans, but uh, let's see what uh, you are uh, going to present uh, to us and uh, then we shall go on with the discussion. So the floor is yours, Mr. Griffson. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I will start by uh, I'm trying to share my screen, but it says it's dis host disabled attendee screen um, sharing. We see you, and uh, I guess that we should. Uh, here we go. Now it's okay. Now it's okay. Yeah. Now I'm allowed. Hopefully, you can all see that. We see everything. Yes. Yep. Okay, very good. So, uh, again, so thank you very much for the invitation. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure. It's an honor to be here. Uh, to present this study as part of, I think, what is a very distinguished panel, and I'm very much looking forward to the discussion and what people have to say uh, about the study and this topic uh, in general. Um, I uh, wanted to say to start, I'm presenting this work on behalf of a lot of people. Uh, this project involved a lot of people. Um, I want to say thank you to the Bettelsmann Stiftung for the opportunity to do this study, especially to Stephanie Weiss for the, the collaboration on, on the project. This was a joint project between us. Uh, and also to all of my colleagues at VV. Uh, really, a lot of people worked on the study. I cannot mention everybody, but to say that we had represented on the study team colleagues from, among others, uh, Serbia, Croatia, Kosovo, Albania. So we hope also our study made some kind of small contribution to the overall effort of, uh, of regional cooperation. Uh, the title of the study is Pushing on a String? Question mark. Uh, the past and future of regional, cooperate, regional economic cooperation uh, in the Western Balkans. And you mentioned um, some uh, maybe lack of optimism, and that's true in a way. And, uh, you know, I don't want to shy away from the harder messages of this study, but I hope I can also present some more constructive uh, points and even a little bit of positivity as I, as I go along. So I should talk for about 15 minutes. Uh, I'm going to do four things, basically, in these 15 minutes. I'll start with the point of the study, what we wanted to achieve, uh, then what we did. Uh, then the third part will be the main findings. That's obviously the main part of the presentation. And then I'll finish with the policy recommendations and conclusions, which can hopefully then lead on to the discussion. So what was the, what do we want to find out in this study? Basically four things. Firstly, were the prerequisites for uh, successful regional economic cooperation, regional economic integration ever there in the Western Balkans over these past uh, two decades? Secondly, did the plan as it was implemented lead to greater economic integration uh, in the region? Thirdly, did this economic integration deliver political results because this was, I mean, part of the whole idea. Uh, it wasn't economic integration just for its own sake. Uh, and then finally, what should be done now and what, what could be the way uh, forward? So these were the four questions we really wanted to address um, in this study. What we did in terms of steps to, to answering these questions were five things. Firstly, we tried to identify and analyze the prerequisites for regional cooperation. And this means in an economic sense, but also in a political an institutional sense. And here we had always in mind the kind of very much best practice example of France and Germany after the, after the Second World War. Number two, we did an econometric analysis of trade and investment initiatives in this region over the whole period. So bilateral investment treaties, free trade agreements, SEFTA, and then the stabilization association agreements. Number three, we did a descriptive analysis of infrastructure connectivity initiatives with a focus on, on of course, what was done by the EU. Number four, we did a stock taking exercise. So how do things look in 2020? What has been achieved? And then finally, we looked in, in a forward looking sense of how could, and this is in a way what leads on to what we hope will be a follow up study to this. How could the Western Balkans integrate more uh, with the EU? So in terms of the main findings, uh, it, I'm presenting here 200 pages of research, basically. So I can only go briefly through, but I hope I can give you at least a, an idea of, of, of the main findings of the study. So the first 
main finding, very simply, regional economic integration has increased a lot over the last 20 years in, in the Western Balkans, and especially thanks to SEFTA. So this chart shows the results of our econometric analysis, the initial free trade agreements, that's the bar on the left, the bilateral free trade agreements would calculate almost 15% uh, increase in, in interregional trade uh, as a result of free trade agreements. SEFTA, the bar on the right, you can see much more significant, uh, well over a third, uh, the increase. So SEFTA or the so-called new SEFTA had a very big, important positive impact on regional economic integration. What we then did, or my, my colleague Goran Vuksic uh, specifically did, was to go through each country in turn, take them out and to see uh, if any interesting patterns emerged. And what we found, you see, is, is the chart here. The gray bars are exactly what I showed on the previous chart, exactly the same. The orange bars show what happens if you take out Serbia. And there you can see that without Serbia, the results both for the free trade agreements and for SEFTA are hugely significant, much more significant. So the increase is about 70% in both cases. So we can say that regional economic integration has increased quite substantially, but much more so for the five smaller countries than for Serbia. What we see over this period, and I think this is not a surprise, this is a well-known story, is that Serbia has really, the direction of economic integration of Serbia over this period has been with the EU. So this chart shows uh, Serbian exports by destination as a share of the total, to the EU on the right, to the rest of the Western Balkans on the left, gray bar is 2000, orange bar is 2019. So you can see Serbian exports to the EU went from bit more than half of the total to about two thirds of the total over this period to the Western Balkans from a bit less than 30% to less than 20% over this period. So for Serbia, I think the, the direction of integration has been pretty clear. What we also find though is despite this really important, significant regional economic integration that's been achieved, the contribution to breaking what my colleague Vladimir Gligorov calls the geography of animosity, and by that he means the territorial constitutional disputes of the region. This has not really been altered. So even though the economic integration has been significant, um, the, 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 the political normalization as a result of this, especially with the most intractable issues, is not very clear. And there are lots of ways to think about that and show that. I just show one example here from the Balkan barometer of how people feel regional relations are going in the region. I have to say we use Balkan barometer a lot in this study. It was a very important resource for us. And this is just one way to show, I think, that the economic progress in, on integration has not made fundamental difference to, to the most significant political, uh, political issues. Fifth conclusion is that the economic integration has not fundamentally altered this very disappointing convergence performance of the region. So this chart, I show the Western Balkan countries and also the EU member states of Central and Eastern Europe and the convergence performance relative to Germany uh, over this whole period. The, the EU member states are in gray and the Western Balkan countries are in orange. And you can see that you know, with the exception, partial exception of Montenegro, the Western Balkan countries have the most disappointing convergence performance over this period. Now, I'm not saying this is because of regional economic integration at all. It's just to say that part of the idea of regional economic integration is to boost economic development. And it may have helped that, but it has not fundamentally altered the situation. And you know, all else being equal, poorer countries should grow faster than, than wealthier countries, which makes, I think, this, this chart and the, the conclusions of this chart even more disappointing. So why is there this disappointment? The, the sixth main conclusion is that in a lot of ways, the prerequisites as, as we saw them in the study for really successful regional economic cooperation and integration often didn't exist during this period. And there were lots of things I could talk about here, but I just mentioned on this slide too. On the left, I have an example of the economic aspects of these prerequisites, and that's just the market size. And this shows nominal GDP 2019 for the Western Balkans as a whole, and then the eight EU member states closest to that level. And what you can see is that the Western Balkans as a whole, GDP is roughly equal to Slovakia. That is 1% of pre-Brexit EU GDP, 
bit more than half of Greece. It's a bit less than half of Portugal. The point is that with such a small market, even an extremely successful regional economic integration scenario, the upside in terms of economic development would probably be always going to be quite small. On the right, uh, I show government effectiveness from the World Bank, also one indicator of institutional quality. And we also found, also looking back through, through, through other examples from history, regional economic integration really requires a lot of institutional capacity and institutional cooperation. And obviously in the Western Balkan case, this was also uh, a challenge. The seventh main conclusion here, I'm back with the uh, Balkan barometer, one of our favorite uh, resources for this study, is people in the region uniformly support regional cooperation as a whole. That's very clear across all countries. There's a very clear majority. That is absolutely not in doubt. The issue, I think, or at least one of the issues is translating from an economic perspective is translating that into concrete action at the elite level. And I think that has been a big part of the issue over the last couple of decades. And that is definitely another important prerequisite is the buy-in to this uh, the economic, economic sense at the, uh, at the elite level. Yeah. Yeah. The eighth main finding, and this goes back a bit to, to, to the, the earlier slides on, on Serbia, is that Serbia has, in a lot of ways, different options, different incentives to the other Western Balkan countries when it comes to regional economic integration. And the EU needs to find a way to change these, these calculations and change these incentives. And I just show here two examples. On the left, the market size. Serbia's GDP is a share of the other five. In any one year, it's between 80 and 100%. So Serbia is much bigger than the other countries. It's pretty much the same as the other countries combined. It makes it easier for Serbia to integrate out the region. It makes Serbia more attractive as a market in many ways for foreign investors. We know Serbia also has other options in terms of third parties outside the region, countries like Russia and China. And on the right, we show Serbia's you know, overall support for, for um, EU membership, which is notably lower uh, than, than in the other countries. And my colleague Vladimir, who already mentioned, he, he argues that um, support in Serbia now for EU accession is, is as low as it has been uh, during the whole period that, that we're looking at here. So there is this specific issue of, of Serbia, which uh, I think needs to be more fundamentally addressed. The ninth main finding, uh, and this is the final one, is that um, the best scenario in an economic sense, I think for the coming years, if we accept that EU accession is not imminent, at least for uh, some of the countries of the region, is to try to replicate as well as possible in an economic sense, the what I would term the positive EU accession shock. And here in the study, we used basically the example of the joiners of 2004, 2007, 2013 from Central and Eastern Europe. And there are lots of ways to think about this and show this, but I just uh, give two examples here. On the left is the budget. So what happens when a country, uh, especially a, of a lower level of economic development, has full access to the, the EU budget and the inflows per year can be 4% or so of GDP. A lot of that goes into public infrastructure, which is a big issue in, in economic integration in general, including uh, in the Western Balkans. And when you compound that over 15 years, as is the case for many of the countries on this chart, this is a really substantial amount of money. And we did the calculations um, in the study of what this would mean for the big net payers into the EU budget, and it's extremely negligible as a share of their GDP. And I think especially in the current environment, when in general, there's a lot of discussion about fiscal policy uh, and, and a big expansion of the budget uh, in, in the EU, this is a very relevant uh, consideration. On the right, we show what happened to interregional trade of the eight Central and Eastern European countries that joined the EU in 2004 after their accession, so rebased to 2004. Orange line is trade between them. The gray line is their trade with the existing, e so the pre-2004 EU member states. And you can see the trade of these countries exploded after accession. And I would argue this is exactly a positive, the positive EU accession shock. Partly it's liberalization of trade, fully of trade between these countries, but it's also the budget, it's the extra and better quality FDI they get as a result of being um, EU members. There's a lot of parts of this story, but I think the, the overall out, outcome of this is, is pretty clear. And some 
replication of this is the best case scenario I think for the for the Western Balkans in uh, in the coming years. So I think I am pretty much done with my time. I may have one more minute, and I will just go through the uh, the conclusions. So my first conclusion is that the region is much more economically integrated than it was 20 years ago. And SEFTA has been especially successful in that. However, Serbia is at least a partial exception to this story. Second conclusion, regional economic integration, the regional cooperation per se, is highly valued by Western Balkan populations in all countries. But the achieved economic integration uh, as part of that has not solved the development problem of the region and it has not solved the main territorial and constitutional disputes. Number three, uh, why this, you know, why it hasn't delivered everything that was hoped for is that at least some of the prerequisites uh, for successful regional economic integration did not exist in the region. Number four, uh, economic integration alone cannot solve anything. It cannot even work properly without direct political breakthroughs. And a very good illustration of that was the 100% tariffs uh, that, that uh, Kosovo put on Serbia and Bosnia at the end of 2018, which basically eliminated uh, bilateral uh, trade. Number five, Serbia has different options and incentives because of its, its size and its political relationships outside the region. And the EU has to find a way to change these uh, calculations as part of the whole uh, accession process. Number six, if we can assume that EU accession is a long way off, and I think unfortunately that is the case for at least some countries of the region, then we need to think much more concretely about what can be in an economic sense in between the current situation and full membership. And we need to think about all these areas, including budget, infrastructure, more goods and services integration, maybe I'm a bit more skeptical about this part, more labor market access, but all of these things need to be considered. And finally, the new EU investment plan, which was mentioned, I think there's a lot of good stuff in there, but the overall amount, and here we come back to the budget question again, is not uh, a game changer compared to what has come before. So that was it. That was a whistle-stop tour of the main conclusions of the study, and I, I look forward to the, to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Gribson, for this uh, presentation. Uh, I uh, believe that um, the study will be an inspiration uh, for our participants uh, to actively involve in the discussion. But uh, before that, uh, we shall hear our discussions. And uh, I go now to uh, Professor Silvana Moisovska. Um, uh, she has, in her research, extensively covered regional uh, cooperation, uh, specifically trade. Uh, so I would uh, ask her uh, to um, also assess the effects of specifically SEFTA and the prospects of the regional economic area. Um, and also uh, one issue that has been very prominent in regional cooperation, how uh, do you see the relation between the EU integration and regional cooperation uh, of the Western uh, Balkans? So Silvana, the floor is yours. Thank you, Malinka. Um, and thank you, Richard, for your presentation. It is a very interesting study. It provides food for thought of this very, very important topic that we deal in the region uh, with uh, for over 10, 15 years. And um, the first point of the conclusion of the study was that SEFTA is, uh, could be regarded as a successful story. Uh, but I would like uh, to see SEFTA in a broader context and how SEFTA has developed towards uh, in, in uh, terms of trade with regards to the EU. If we uh, take the data in absolute terms, in 2010, uh, the region uh, trade among itself at certain extent and uh, the correct figures were intra-SEFTA export was around 4 billion euros and intra-SEFTA import was about uh, 3.7 billion euros. In 2018 and uh, 2019, the figures are similar. Uh, the figures were the export increase to uh, 4.8 billion euros and the import increase to 4.2 billion euros. So 
In absolute terms, there is an increase that there is no doubt. But what triggers me is what happens on the relative share. In 2010, the countries uh, among themselves uh, seems to trade it more in relative terms than in 2018. On the terms of export, it was 19% share in 2010 versus 16% share in 2010, in 2011. Uh, but then on the import side, we have uh, 16% uh, percent in 2010 versus only nine in 2018. So if the countries import only 9% of their overall import from uh, the region, and there is a decrease, apparently the numbers uh, show that, uh, that means that uh, probably there is uh, the potential of SEFTA has not been particularly used. So uh, if we uh, put on top of it the uh, trade data with the EU, we would see that all the countries somehow focus towards the EU. And uh, I've done a lot of research on this topic, trying to find uh, some uh, responses why the things are like that. And I realized that the trade, unfortunately, within SEFTA was not internally driven. It was mainly externally driven. That means by the framework set by the uh, European Union, as all the countries have free access to the EU market, and you cannot force business or companies to trade with, within SEFTA because there is a political decision to develop the regional cooperation. And the other thing is all these countries has invested a lot of efforts and time to uh, attract foreign direct investors. And foreign direct, uh, foreign direct investments actually has uh, contributed to increase the trade a lot in this uh, period of uh, five, 10 years in all the countries of the Western Balkans. And unfortunately, the figures show that um, the total intra-SEFTA trade is actually lower uh, than the a trade of the SEFTA region with Germany, only with one country of the EU. So these are the distinctions that makes us think why and what should be done. If uh, we do a sectoral analysis, we will realize that uh, not much trade creation has been done. So what is there is mostly based on traditional links. What was there prior to the SEFTA because uh, SEFTA actually uh, supposed to introduce um, uh, a trade advantage in terms of removal of non-tariff barriers, and it started to happen late. So I would, uh, that is going on now, it's a going on process, but I would say that we have to have in mind the time dynamic of development of SEFTA. And uh, SEFTA, Unfortunately, I must say it's a very slow uh, institution in terms of uh, setup because all the uh, decisions are uh, has to be done by uh, unanimity and all the countries have to agree. So the processes are going slowly. So I would say that yes, SEFTA is important. And I must agree that uh, with the recent development with regards to the EU integration, regional integration of the region is becoming more and more important. And here um, efforts must be uh, done by the political leaders, but I find the key uh, in the term political, I see both processes. Malinka asked me to make a parallel. How do, do I find them? I see both processes going on in a parallel way. And then uh, uh, the first one, uh, EU integration is uh, done uh, by political will, but also uh, because of the process of harmonization of our key with the, of our national legislation with the EU key, there is certain policy content with regards uh, to the, uh, uh, regional integration, we have uh, a situation only of, I would say, political willingness. Uh, very rarely in the documents of the Western Balkans dealing with trade, export, uh, ex 
uh, strategies for uh, export expansion and so on, you will very rarely find even a word on SEFTA, how to develop. So uh, apparently uh, SEFTA is there, it's a good ground to do something. In uh, absolute terms, the trade has increased, but in relative, unfortunately, it was not the main driver for, for the introduction of, uh, for stimulating the economic growth in the region. Uh, the I find I find the necessity here uh, to develop more policy content. In your study, I have uh, read it very carefully. You also focus on transport infrastructure and other things. All dimensions of uh, regional economic area are there. So uh, probably um, uh, we we lack this type of studies in uh, lots of studies in uh, different areas that would uh, connect these four dimensions because SEFTA by itself, it exists, it started to function better. Now we have that additional protocol five and we have protocol on our services. And now they started finally the negotiations for uh, dispute, for mechanism for dispute resolution and then so on. Uh, but uh, uh, very often I still have a perception and it was also confirmed on all uh, annual SEFTA conferences that uh, this is mainly a political process, that somehow the political leaders focusing on the EU integration uh, was, were, were not so much into this process. And then we have the issue finally, that is the last issue, but uh, not the less important, the issue of resources. All these countries are very small. And uh, also the destiny of SEFTA changes when uh, one country is going out of SEFTA. That happened with Croatia, and that will happen even more with Serbia because Serbia uh, participates uh, with 30% of the trade of SEFTA. It's very important, especially for, her on, for it on the export side, for other countries on the import side. Uh, so, uh, Focusing on a strategy, how to connect the dots, how to connect all these uh, uh, actors that are in the process and to rationalize the resources is probably uh, the mm, issue that should be further elaborated uh, by, by all actors. The Vienna Institute is really one of the prominent ones that produce lots of very useful studies, lots of food for thought for, for all of us, but probably also a connection on an expert level and as well an institutional level among the countries uh, would uh, maybe make a difference in um, not uh, uh, for these two processes not to go in a parallel way, EU integration and regional cooperation of the Western Balkans, but to uh, be merged and to have uh, better effects. That would be my contribution so far. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Silvana. You also gave us some more food for, for thought. Uh, and we'll get back to this issue certainly in the discussion. Uh, yeah, I would also, now that we are in the middle of the discussions, uh, like to uh, encourage uh, everybody to pose written uh, questions so that we can organize the discussion in a more rational way. Now you have uh, enough food for thought to start uh, posing the, the questions. Of course, of course, you will be able also to pose the questions early, but I would encourage you to, to do so uh, right uh, to everyone. Uh, so thank you, Silvana, uh, again. And uh, now I will uh, give the floor to Mr. Reljic. Uh, and of course, I will uh, give uh, him uh, some uh, uh, questions also that I think would be important uh, for us, especially that Mr. Rivich has consistently advocated for access to increase the EU funds, uh, specifically structural funds for the Western Balkan countries uh, in order to encourage uh, convergence of their economies with the EU. And we saw what the state of affair with convergence uh, is. This has not happened. Um, instead, an investment and economic plan was presented. So, Mr. Rilic, how do you assess uh, the plan? And also, in light of the assessments so far and lacking enough support from the EU budget, uh, 
which initiatives or areas of regional cooperation would you see as most worthy of attention? Is it possible or necessary to prioritize? Uh, Silvana mentioned that uh, we need to merge all the dots. Um, so uh, between maybe this approach is uh, what would be um, uh, your suggestions, your ideas. Uh, the floor is yours. Uh, Malinka, you asked me what's my impression about this uh, economic and investment plan that uh, Commissioner Varkeli has recently presented. And I'll answer by using a word from the serb or Croat language. I hoped that it exists also in Macedonian. Uh, the word is Shibitsarenje. I don't know whether you know this word. This is, you know, when those guys take uh, match boxes of matches and sort of play a game with you. I looked for a long time to find the English equivalent and it's jiggery pokery, the English one. In German it's Hütchenspielerei. Because uh, Varcheli and the other people in Brussels are touting this plan as a big push for development in the region and they are saying we are going to offer to you up to 9 billion euro in grants. So if people are not familiar with the figures, they might believe this for a minute. However, in the analysis of the European Parliament's research service, which is the in-house think tank of the European Parliament, when they looked into the figures, they said that actually the EPA 3 money, the instrument for pre-accession money, and this up to 9 billion should come from EPA 3 money, that EPA 3 is already in purchasing power, in real value, less than what EPA 2 had. And EPA 2 was less than what EPA 1 was. So we see that actually the financial commitment of the European Union through the instrument for pre-accession assistance is falling, is going back. In any case, this 9 billion euro are far below the actual necessities of the region. And I think that uh, the paper which Richard Gribson and Mario Holzer and Radu Gligoro produce is extremely important. And you said it should, be, it should inspire us for discussion. I think it should inspire, first of all, the members of the parliaments in the EU member countries, and also some people here in Brussels, to get a realistic picture of what is going on. Because they also tend to be sort of impressed by the 9 billion. However, if you look at the, at the figures that are floating around for the EU countries in the region, for the neighbors, then you get the real dimension of the whole issue. Bulgaria, North, Northern Macedonia's neighbor to the east, will receive from the structural funds and from the EU recovery fund in the coming budget, 29 billion euro. This is for less than 7 million people, 29 billion euro. Croatia will receive 20 billion euro for less than 4 million people. And the so-called Western Balkans, the Southeast European six, for 18 million people will receive 9 billion euro. So some people might say, but they are not members of the European Union. However, through the stabilization and association agreements, they have opened their small economies to the European Union. And in the last 10 years or so, they've accumulated a deficit in trade with the European Union of more than 110 billion euro. So at the end of the day, there is more money, more capital flowing out from the region to the core countries of the EU than is arriving as grants for development. And these grants are most important because, and I think that Richard's paper has also proven this, the Southeast European Six cannot accumulate enough capital for development. That's the basic issue. The region is not developing fast. It's developing below the necessity. The World Bank has long ago calculated that the region would have to develop with 6% annually to achieve the EU average standard in 30 years. 
what's happening now is that there is a divergence. The environment, the vicinity, the EU member countries around the so-called Western Balkans, with the money they're going to receive in the next seven years, are going to have some development in spite of the pandemic. And whatever they had in development in the last couple of years, it came through EU funds. It was not by domestic accumulation, mostly. So we'll see that the environment, the vicinity of the Southeast European Six is going to develop and the region itself is going to stagnate and perhaps go, go back. So there are two basic outcomes of this. One is that the people living in the region have understood the economics, the political economy between the EU and their countries. And their conclusion is the most rational ones. They understand that good life will not come to them in their lifetime and in the lifetime of their children. So what they do is they move where the life is good. They move to the European Union. And the figures are really overwhelming. In 2018, before the pandemic, every two minutes, one citizen of the Western Balkans legally moved to the EU. Every two minutes. We had, in 2018, 230,000 people from the Western Balkans legally moving to the EU, which means that less people will have to pay back more foreign loans. There will be, uh, there is already a lack of, of labor. So all the development plans, all the beautiful priorities which, which um, Commissioner Varheli has created in his financial investment plans will not materialize. There is not enough capital, there is not enough labor, and the better qualified people are moving out. So I think that we have reached already a point of no return in terms of human capital in the region. And the second point where we also have probably reached a point of no return is the environment. Uh, Richard has mentioned the Regional Cooperation Council with the Balkan Barometer, but they also did a couple of years ago a very important study on the environment in the region, on the climate change. And especially Northern Macedonia and Kosovo and Montenegro will be affected strongly by the climate change in the next years, especially the heating up and this will change agriculture, although this will change floods, this will make life different. So I don't think that there is any kind of understanding about the uh, seriousness of the development problems in the region. And I don't think that there is readiness in Brussels, in Berlin, to look at the figures. Also in Richard's study, which showed that with a minimal amount of money, Richard, you correct me now, I think that you've calculated it's 0.02 of the German GDP, that with this investment, the region would have far more money to develop. So, What's going to happen? I think that this shibitsarenya, uh, this jiggery pokery, will continue. And in the meanwhile, there will be less and less support for EU membership. And people will understand that they will live not in the kind of uh, political system and democracy which, uh, after the fall of communism, the EU promised to them if they become like the EU. Um, social benefits, uh, equality, income inequality, all of these things in the Western Balkans are starting to look far more like the type of political capitalism that has been developed in China and in Russia. I'd like to point out to the excellent works of Branko Milanovic on this, on political capitalism, which is based on, on, on the elites appropriating money, the few stealing from the many, basically. And liberal capitalism, the way we have been taught to expect to spread throughout Europe, will diminish more and more. So it's quite a bleak picture that I'm painting, but I think it's far better to be realistic about it than to continue repeating the phrases which have been coming out, especially from Brussels, but also from, from some uh, European capitals. And to finish with a little bit of advertisement together with a 
group of colleagues, and I see Matteo, but Matteo Bonomi is also participating in this conference. We have produced uh, just recently a paper called uh, Make or Break Moment. It's about EU enlargement policy in times of pandemic. And I'll distribute the link to this paper in which I think we have far in a far better way explain what I've tried to say just now. I see that Matteo has woken up and he is now on the screen as well. So thank you for letting me spread a little bit of bad mood on a Friday morning. Um, on the contrary, thank you very much, uh, Dushan, for being so frank, uh, because I think this is uh, uh, quite uh, necessary and needed in our, in our region. And as uh, we as a uh, think, uh, um, Tankers uh, are free um, to choose our words. Uh, this time I would also opt for uh, uh, more realism um, because uh, it, it's not the time um, to paint a pink uh, picture, if especially when there is no ground for it. So uh, let's go to more realism. Um, and um, I will now uh, introduce uh, Ms. Maya Hanjiska Trendafilova, a very dear uh, colleague of mine from the Secretariat for European Affairs, um, who is now the uh, program, uh, the, the director of the program department in the um, Regional Cooperation Council. And um, I remember even from the uh, establishment, the underlying motto uh, has been ownership, uh, but we are still speaking, as Silvana said, of um, more imposed uh, agendas. Um, uh, the study highlights the role of the RCC in increasing ownership. It also highlights its efforts in regional initiatives. Uh, but I would ask uh, Maya as an um, insider, uh, could she tell us more about the main issues that the RCC is fa uh, facing in steering the numerous initiatives, uh, especially uh, in the light of uh, the study statement and the statements that we heard from the discussion that tension between the European perspective and the condition for regional cooperation has proved persistent over time. Uh, in this sense, could you please refer to the issue of phasing in EU integration? And could you also share, if you have time, some examples, like, for example, the initiative with the update of the bilateral investment treaties, bilateral investment treaties in the, in the region? Uh, the floor is yours, yours, Maya. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Malinka. And thanks for extending the, the invite. Thanks, Richard, for the rather stimulating presentation. And uh, of course, the study and all the, the discussions for, for their perspective. So let me start first by, by sort of agreeing with one of the, the general findings of the study uh, that the study puts forward. And this is of the need for more regional cooperation. But at the same time, the much more pronounced need for more ambitious economic integration in the EU type of, of, of measures. And for us, it is rather telling and, and, and encouraging that uh, a regional cooperation is grounded and is, enjoys this big uh, uh, public uh, support, uh, as, as also stressed by Richard. And as we very regularly uh, check the pulse through the uh, our Balkan barometer. And for us, this is very important uh, tailwind for our uh, future work. So let me focus on, on the tension aspect uh, that, that uh, Malinka, you mentioned, or the complementarities between regional cooperation and, and EU uh, integration as, I mean, ultimately they are both the DNA of the, of the Regional Cooperation Council. I mean, we, we live and breathe regional cooperation and, and, and European integration on a, on a daily basis. So the point I, I'd like to, to make here is there needs not necessarily to be a tension between the regional cooperation and, and, and the EU integration if the regional cooperation agendas are built on the EU rules and, and standards or on this EU model speed, which is something that we in RCC try to, uh, to foster. I mean, we, we also uh, saw uh, summarized in the study, regional cooperation really proliferated in, in, in the, the, the past years, be this as a result of the implementation of CEFTA, be this the implementation of the Southeast Europe 2020 strategy, connectivity agenda, various Berlin process agendas, uh, etc. And we in RCC have actually steered a big, a big uh, 
chunk of, of, of this uh, agendas and, and, and the study welcomes this, uh, this uh, proactive uh, approach. And regional cooperation, I have to say, in a region such as ours, small, fragmented, I mean, even conflict-laden uh, region has a lot of merits and, and the potential even in, in itself, uh, uh, be this on a political level, meaning, I don't know, confidence building, consensus building, and also at an economic level in terms of um, market and, and, and economies of, of uh, scale. And some of the, some of the regional cooperation efforts uh, uh, in the past, they are at the level of, I don't know, soft knowledge transfer, uh, uh, sharing experiences, whereas some in our view have generated concrete results and they have even resulted in, in, in all inclusive multilateral legal instruments and frameworks. I don't know, be this uh, the additional protocols that Silvana uh, mentioned in terms of trade facilitation, liberalization of trading services, be this the now overly quoted regional roaming uh, agreement. But this regional cooperation should not be with the ultimate uh, uh, goal and end in itself. And, and this is where the catch is actually, how can these tensions be, be uh, reduced or minimized as they will always be there. Be this because of the uh, varied integration dynamics, be this because of different incentives uh, governments have for regional cooperation. However, these tensions can be, uh, can be minimized if, as I said, the basis of, uh, of the regional cooperation is the uh, EU model suite. And this is, I think, the, the way forward towards dispelling the, the fears that we very frequently hear in terms of detours and alternatives to the, to the EU integration process. And as you hinted, I, I will try to give some examples as to uh, how do we try to, to, to model or uh, uh, the agendas that we either directly support or, or, or that are part of this regional economic integration uh, agenda. I mean, you, you mentioned this investment uh, standards, the region together uh, developed uh, so-called uh, uh, soft uh, uh, standards for negotiating uh, international investment agreements and bilateral investment treaties, which are fully modeled on, on EU uh, uh, and international uh, best practices, or the regional roaming agreement that, that we negotiated that is fully based on the roaming uh, regulation or the mutual recognition of a professional qualification process that we are uh, trying to, uh, to push forward that is fully, fully based on the directive in the EU for uh, pro uh, recognition of professional qualifications or the FDI screening mechanisms or the, the, the guidance that we, that we want to, to introduce, of course, again, uh, fully based on, on, on the EU. A number of processes that are coming up in terms of cutting the cost for cross-border payments or so transactions, this will also, of course, be, be modeled on, on the EU one. I mean, we are just a couple of days after the digital summit in Tirana, Tirana in where, where uh, our region took sort of commitment to collaborate uh, further on 5G, which again also follows the, 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 the EU um, toolbox, etc. So you would also gather that this EU integration uh, and EU alignment element is, is pretty prominent in, in the work that, that we try to, to do. I mean, like we've been pushing to, to open the Western Balkans investment framework for digital investments in which we, we, we succeeded firstly just for technical assistance, then also for investment or the fact that we've been trying to, to integrate the region in many of the working groups, platforms, et cetera, of, of, of the EU. So this is the first point that yes, the regional cooperation should be uh, based on the, on the uh, EU standards models and this uh, 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 fit. And now the second big, uh, big point I, I want to make, of course, uh, the bigger impact and incentives uh, will be whenever there is an EU integration element associated with the regional integration, the regional cooperation measures. So it is very important what does the regional cooperation measure unlock at the EU level? And, and, and here I agree with, with the study that this EU integration element or EU economic integration or integration in the single market should be the more prominent element. So it should not be the secondary relegated. So it should not be 
sort of the timid second part of the sentence. So regional economic cooperation and integration in EU single uh, market. And we have tried to, to the best of our, our ability and inspiration to put measures of, of such type in, in what uh, uh, we are now calling the common regional uh, market agenda, which will hopefully be endorsed uh, in Sofia. And, and here I will also illustrate with a with, uh, with few uh, points. I mean, uh, the, the green agenda, which is another overly quoted, the, the, sorry, the green, uh, the green corridors initiative, another for my taste overly quoted, uh, quoted uh, initiative, a rather successful one that, that the region undertook in the immediate aftermath of the, of the pandemic, which ensured this, this free flow of, of goods and medicines. Of course, this uh, needs to be extended to all border crossing points across the Western Balkans. But this needs to be extended to the border crossings with member states because we know where the queues are, we know where the waiting time ac accumulates, so we know where the economic impact will be generated. So this is an agenda that we will try to, to push uh, uh, with safety and authenticity and that is part of now this common regional market. I mean, in terms of the regional roaming agreement, of course, it brought really substantial benefits. I mean, the, the data is we are talking for 96, I mean, the costs are 96% are less. However, uh, what the costs are with the EU, they're, they're, they have no market. Uh, uh, I mean, you cannot find sense. I mean, for, I don't know, 10 mega and I don't know how many minutes of, 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 of calls, uh, uh, an operator in the, uh, would charge you between 300 and 600 euros. Imagine what is this for a, for a salary or, or uh, uh, of, of a Western Balkan uh, citizens. So there has to be an extension of this agenda towards reducing uh, the cost with the regional roaming, uh, with, uh, with uh, EU. Or the, the, the uh, uh, example that you mentioned on the investment uh, standards. So yes, fine, we are going to work towards aligning the investment climate in the region. However, the bigger incentive is, and this is an agenda that re the region wants to push, if we renegotiate this old-fashioned, old-generation bilateral investment uh, treaties with the EU member states, which are over 100, which are of very old uh, generation, limiting the policy space uh, uh, for the region, etc., if we are going to uh, renegotiate them as in individual, every of the six, with the EU, because the EU can do this now, uh, so this will be the major impact, and this is an incentive for the region. And so we we need uh, receptiveness from that side as well uh, to push such agendas. And luckily, uh, uh, this is also a major uh, part of the the common regional uh, market or the 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 process that we are entering in. As I said, cutting cross border uh, transaction costs within SEFTA region. The point is that the continuation is cost efficient transactions with the EU and the region joining the single European payment uh, area, uh, et cetera. So I, I don't want to give you too many, uh, too many examples, but you would, you would get my, uh, the, the logic behind, uh, behind opening the, unlocking the EU element of, of, of the agendas. For instance, what, what the region wants to do is this uh, agreement for a study in which students from one will have the sort of natural, national or domestic status in the other five. And the idea is that this also in, in future is, is open to, to the EU. I mean, the, the, the same like, like Bosnia status, Bosnia students had uh, in Austria until recently. Or in a very positive agenda, the region will now open the research infrastructure that one of the economists, and, and sorry for this political correct language of RCC, that one of the economists has, it will open on a sort of domestic uh, uh, treatment to all the other five, the research infrastructure, so of course, where is the incentive? The incentive is that this agenda is continued with uh, us uh, uh, also having an EU researchers uh, and scientific community uh, having uh, access uh, to both in the in the EU in the in the and in the Western Balkans. So these are the type of measures that we welcome. We want to push forward, and if there are any bright ideas, of course, we would be more than happy to to, of course, uh, 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 try to, to, to push them uh, forward. So these agendas can be the elements of this so-called phasing 
in, even though it's uh, uh, not clear for, for many what does this mean and for which we really demand more info, more leads, more, more practical examples on the side of the, of the EU. So I will uh, more or less stop here, Malinka, just a just few words on this forthcoming common regional market agenda that, that they announced that will be hopefully uh, uh, endorsed at the, at the SOFIA summit, which is in essence this regional economic integration agenda with links to the uh, uh, integrating in the EU single market. So it rests on the four freedoms uh, and also uh, agendas uh, in the areas of uh, digital, innovation, uh, investment. And of course, the backdrop against which we developed it is also learning what worked and did not work from the regional economic area, but also the, the, the COVID context, which also shows that regional cooperation can maybe be an important element in the in the post uh, recovery uh, context. So I would put a caveat around the name because I don't want to be the overly optimistic discussant here. No, no pink glasses also on our side uh, and the caveat around the common regional market. So, I mean, of course, implementing these measures, even if full political commitment, even if we have, I don't know, a brilliant track record will not enact a common regional market in the region, of course, uh, uh, over overnight. It will, uh, it will not suddenly effectuate it, but these are good elements, some even ambitious. They will open uh, new opportunities for, 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 for citizens and, and for businesses, and even improve uh, competitiveness and attractiveness of the region. However, a proper common regional market, even a proper economic integration in the EU necessitates far more comprehensive uh, measures, uh, very serious commitment, governance, strong business impulse. I mean, the, the list of, of, of even the political uh, pre-requirements that, that Richard mentioned at, at the onset. And I also, my fear is that, you know, with such uh, big convergence gap, with the very significant downturn that, that COVID, uh, that COVID uh, uh, impacted, uh, and the rather slow accession dynamics, we really need we really need more more and, and immediate measures. And otherwise, I agree with Dushan. I mean, our human capital is thinning out so rapidly. I mean, on top of these dreadful figures that he that you mentioned on 2018, this close to quarter of a million. I mean, I was checking recently, and not all EU even reported the, the number of official work permits. There was a 50 percent hike in 2019 on official working permits. And uh, it was so uh, so dreadful that for some of the economies in Kosovo and Montenegro, the growth was above 90%, 92 and 99. And, and, and this is the, 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 the serious background against the, we are, we are uh, working. And another sort of uh, uh, difficult uh, uh, note, I mean, even yesterday, the, the forecast came out from, from the EU, the, the, the autumn forecast. I mean, we are talking about 14% uh, uh, GDP uh, decline, seven, five uh, in, in North Macedonia. So really, really the situation calls for, for much more serious uh, work, vision, commitment from, from all sides. And thanks, Melinka, I will, I will stop here. Thank you so much, Maya. Um, for this, um, and um, especially for the phasing in uh, food for thought, because I think we should go back to, to this issue, not in terms of technical just phasing in, but really the uh, how does, does regional cooperation really lead to integration or not uh, at, at this point, and how it could uh, maybe more uh, lead to it. Um, and I will now go back to open the discussion. So as I said, you can either pose the questions um, in the chat um, and uh, we'll um, go revert to them or uh, you can raise your hand and uh, pose the question directly. So to save um, now time, I will go to the questions that you uh, already um uh, so, uh, so first of all, uh, these are both uh, questions from uh, Mr. Florian uh, Feyerabend 
And the first one uh, relates to trade. So I will ask uh, Richard and Silvana, probably one of them. Uh, what uh, implications do you see for the FTA of Serbia with the Euro-Asian Union? What would be the impact for regional trade among the Western Balkans? And then we'll go to the next uh, next question. Yeah. Um, well, it's an, it's an important question. We, we address this issue in uh, the study. I mean, I don't think that it will necessarily have an impact now or in the coming years on regional trade in the Western Balkan Six. I mean, I think the issue uh, of the of Serbia's FDA with the Eurasian Economic Union is what it means about Serbia's EU accession you know, or, or any further economic integration into the EU ahead of accession. You know, I think, I mean, obviously to join the EU, Serbia will need to give this up. And I think probably only full EU accession will persuade Serbia to give this up. I mean, this is a huge, I think, political obstacle now to Serbia's uh, economic uh, integration with uh, with the EU. And I, I mentioned, you know, the point of, of Serbia in, in particular among the six countries that its incentives are different, its options uh, are different. And this is a very good example of that. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gripson, Subana, would you add something or? Well, I would add, uh, add just that uh, probably Serbia is uh, looking for different options uh, because if we look for the trade data uh, from all these countries from uh, Euro-Asian Union, uh, Serbia trades uh, mainly with Russia and uh, the, the share of trade of Serbia with Russia is about 10% compared to over 60, 65 to the European Union. So apparently the business goes to you at the moment, uh, but uh, here we have to take uh, into consideration uh, the energy market. So uh, that is something that uh, should be uh, uh, analyzed more deeply. But I believe that uh, it is an agreement that it signed, but uh, how it will develop, it very much depends on the further development of the integration of Serbia uh, with the EU market. Uh, thank you, Mr. Grison. Thank you, Silvana. So I will go to the next question, um, uh, which is again from Mr. Fireabank. Uh, the question is mainly to Dushan, uh, although I think we all, all might be tempted <laughs> to uh, chip in. Uh, would more money or access to structural cohesion fund uh, not diminish the incentives for reforms? Um, would uh, these enranched governments uh, uh, in the uh, Western Balkans? And uh, what about the absorption capacity? Uh, you all can see in the, the, the question. So, Mr. Rejlich, uh, your additional remarks on this issue. I'll, I'll go just for a moment back to uh, Florian's first question about the implications of trade with third partners in the region. You know, uh, in, in the socialist times, there was a joke in a newspaper, people would trade uh, apartments and cars in the newspapers. And in, in, in Novost, in Belgrade, there was an uh, advertisement I'm trading a Wartburg for a Moskvich. Uh, nothing for nothing, you know. Uh, the structure of trade, for instance, Serbia's structure of trade with the EU is based on industrial products. The uh, raise of trade that Northern Macedonia and Serbia achieved with the EU in the last 10 years or so was basically through participation in value producing chains starting in Germany, automotive industry mostly. You can't sell those parts that Continental, a huge German company is producing in Subotica for Audi cars in Jer in Hungary, which are then exported to China. You can't sell those parts in Kazakhstan because the integration is so far at the moment that the turn of the structure and of the orientation in trade is not possible to achieve without huge losses. So I think that this uh, trade agreements with the Eurasian Union and even with Russia are, as Silvana said, 
concentrated on very few products and very few branches like energy and there is nothing more happening there and can't happen because already now the region is firmly integrated in the EU. This brings me to the second point, whether more money could lead to more uh, corruption and stealing. Well, yes, uh, you have this issue wherever state money is handed out and it's not uh, only limited to the Southeast European Six, it also happens in the EU, it happens, we know it in Germany, from the money which was transferred from Western to East Germany. Whenever there are transfers, state money transfers, there is also part of it being stolen. How can you prevent this? You prevent it in by having the European Union, for instance, through revamping the European Agency for Reconstruction and Development, which used to exist in Thessaloniki for a long time for the region, when you have an institution like this participating in the planning, in the execution, and in the audition of the money which is being invested uh, through structural funds, through uh, post-COVID rehabilitation funds, it, there is no big um, science about it. It's, a, it's the same way in which you control money spending in other countries which are in the European Union. If you use the same uh, instruments, you will also have a good insight into how money is spent, uh, external money, how external money is being spent in, in Southeast European Six. Whether they have the absorption capacity, yes, of course, uh, because infrastructure, research and development, education, these are all fields which are not limited to what's happening in North Macedonia or to Serbia or to Montenegro. If you're building infrastructure in the region, this is directly connected to EU interests because the roads and the railways coming from Greece and passing to Northern Macedonia to Serbia are going then to Hungary and going to Bulgaria and going to Croatia, which are EU member states. So you can't think the region outside the EU. The region is not a neighbor. It's the soft belly of the European Union. And this is especially true in the field of environment. You can't have clean air in Southeast Europe if the thermal coal plants are going to be continuing to work in Serbia, in Northern Macedonia, in Montenegro and so on. So this is the absorption capacity. Modernize the energy sector, for instance, and this is going to be of direct use to the European Union as well. I don't think that this will uh, change the uh, inclination of the political class in the region for reforms because uh, at this moment I think that with the exception of the Northern Macedonia we have hugely authoritarian and populist uh, governments in the region and their interest is certainly not to reform but uh, people don't eat reforms people need development to become less dependent on the state and to, to, to become more autonomous in, it, in their thinking and behavior towards the state. Unmute Malinka, we cannot hear you. Yes. I, I realized it. Dushan, uh, thank you again for going even deeper than, uh, than asked and highlighting some important issues. Now, Richard, as I saw, would like to add up uh, to this discussion. Yes, th thank you. I'd like to add on. I mean, I would flip the question around. I would say, you know, if we don't change fundamentally the, the level of funds going from Brussels to the region, then I think we definitely won't see any so-called tough reforms. And I think we definitely will see entrenchment of increasingly authoritarian governments. I mean, I think that is, under the status quo, that is an extremely likely scenario. So something has to change. And I think a lot of us here agree that the, the budget is, is a big part of this. I mean, I would like to, to, to add on this discussion just to, to, to respond to something that, uh, that Dushan said as well. I mean, you have here a region that is fully surrounded by the EU, which has had an EU official EU perspective for, for 17, years, which is, you know, these are countries which are officially on the way to the EU. And when we look at what has been promised, the, the, the up to 9 billion, 
I mean, we're talking about IPA2 minus inflation. And I think in a world where we're talking about a 750 billion euro recovery fund with Croatia and Bulgaria getting something between 15 and 20% of their GDP allocated out of that. I think this is a very problematic statement from the perspective of the region to see what is on offer. And we did the calculations in the study. I didn't show it because it's so small that the, the scale is weird, but um, what this would mean to include the countries in the EU budget on the same level as Hungary, for example, um, you, you cannot see it on the, on the, on the scale as, in terms of share of GDP of not only Germany, all of the net payers, Ireland and Austria and all, and all of the net payers. I mean, it's so completely negligible as a share of their GDP. And I think in the current context, considering the gravity of the situation, considering the urgency because of the pandemic, because of the outward migration, this, from the perspective of the region, those who care about the Western Balkans, this is a very worrying sign, actually, I think, what, what, what happened with the, the budget and the new investment plan this time. It, it says something about the current thinking in Brussels, it, it seems to me. Malinka? Yes, Maya. Just, just a small, I mean, I would not, of course, comment again on the adequacy of the, of the size of the, of the package, but just to, to also stress certain positive uh, elements, at least in, in, in my reading, uh, around uh, uh, the investment package, which, of course, this, the, the 9 billion, of also everything in parentheses provided the uh, multiannual financial framework is uh, uh, approved. There will be also an element of crowding in investments through, through the guarantee, but a couple of, of points. First, uh, this grouping into big regional projects, which was not as prominent in the, in the last uh, uh, EPA, this might generate bigger impact, so bigger projects, bigger impact, versus the more technical assistance, national envelopes type of, type of uh, assistance in the, in the current EPA. This is one. The second, this front-loading element that is announced, let's see how is this uh, enacted, and also this closer link with the political priorities of, of the union in terms of green and, and energy transition. So there are this, in, in my view, positive, uh, positive elements. Uh, however, of course, we, we here shared our views as to whether this will be a, a, a game changer or, or not. But I just wanted to, to touch upon this alignment with the, with the, the priority as, as well as this front loading and the novelty of aggrandizing or grouping into bigger, bigger uh, flagship uh, projects. Thank you, Maya, for this intervention. Uh, now I don't see a raised hand or a question, uh, but I think uh, we can go on with uh, um, the discussion uh, with uh, looking forward. Uh, we have not uh, seen uh, a pink uh, picture portrayed. Uh, we have seen quite uh, some um, um, critical observations as to the complementarity of the regional cooperation process and the EU integration uh, process. Um, and uh, especially we have seen a, a quest for much more EU in uh, uh, the Balkans uh, or the Western Balkans or whatever, Southeast <laughs> Europe or the, the, the soft belly, that one I liked, um, of uh, Europe. So much more funds, but much more EU in every, in every sense. Um, in, in these uh, terms, I would have a question, um, firstly, for, for Mr. Griffson, uh, as you suggest in your study, um, to focus efforts on the maximum level of economic integration possible with the EU. But uh, your concrete proposals include uh, joining the EU Customs Union and expanding the existing SAAs to include deeper integration in services and the labor market. Uh, so do you think these proposals are uh, far reaching enough to correspond to the needs, or you think they might contribute more uh, to faster, uh, let's say, EU integration via regional cooperation? 
to unmute myself. This is a very important question. Thank you. And I'll, there's a lot to say. I'll try to be as concrete and brief as possible. Um, I mean, in the study, we presented a lot of different options of how integration with the EU could go from here. And we did not come down extremely hard on any one or any group of proposals. You know, this is really, as I said, what we hope will be the follow-up study to this, to go into this much more deeply. What I would say is basically two things. Firstly, it, further integration, region, regional economic, regional cooperation in general is a good thing, full stop. Regional economic integration is also a good thing, but we have to be extremely realistic about what the upside is. And Silvana already highlighted this, I think, with, with her initial intervention about SEFTA. You know, SEFTA has produced a positive impact, but relative to the EU, of course not. And, you know, why would we have expected anything different? We're talking about an economy the size of Slovakia here. We're talking about 1% of pre-Brexit uh, EU GDP. So, of course, the, the economic effects of anything with the EU will much outweigh regional in integration. That's, I think, inevitable. So any going further with specifically regional integration in the economic sense, we have to be very realistic. I'm not against any of that. I'm not arguing against it, but we have to be very realistic what the potential upside of that is. When it comes to further integration with the EU, I think all of these things need to be considered. As I mentioned in my presentation, I'm a bit more skeptical on the labor side, but we have to go into that more. We can think about, you know, the, the, the model of Turkey is in the customs union. We can think about the kind of ser extra services integration that is in the DCFDA from Ukraine. I mean, we mentioned all of this in the study. These are all things to think about, but it has to be part of a package. And I think Dujan already hinted at this, that the demand side within the region has to be considered. If we only liberalize trade and, and, and migration with the EU, the, the, the region will just run a bigger and bigger deficit with the EU, basically. You know, it, there needs to be an increase of local capital, of, of local demand. And that's why I think this whole model of trying to replicate before full accession, which is politically impossible at the moment, the, the economic aspects of accession of the 2004 joiners. And the most obvious, and, and, and that means the liberalization, but that also means... I think especially the budget, that's the most obvious thing. And I think we've shown several of us that in what we've said that that is not a big, it doesn't have to be a big thing from the EU side on the budget to make a huge difference in the Western Balkans. But I think also FDI, we did a study a few years ago for, for SEFTA looking at FDI in the region. And you see that, yes, it has attracted a certain amount of FDI. Dushan already mentioned it. Uh, Serbia and North Macedonia have been pretty successful in, in manufacturing FDI, for example. But it's not of a quality or scale comparable with the EU member states at all. Uh, it hasn't generated very important uh, local spillovers in a lot of areas. I mean, we're talking here about the hub and spoke with the EU relationship with Germany or Italy, basically. We're not talking about great spillovers to lots of local companies and, and this kind of thing. And so this is all part of the story. I'm not saying that any one of these things is the answer, but without full e accession, I think this, or we think this, attempting to replicate EU membership in an economic sense is the most, is the, is the most likely way to achieve the greatest level of economic development in the region uh, that we have at the moment. And I know there are criticisms of this whole development model as it is applied to the Visegrad countries, etc. I fully accept that, but I don't see what else is on offer at the moment. I don't see any better alternative uh, at the moment. And I think this is a very reasonable way forward. And I would like to just finally say, I didn't emphasize it in my presentation, but it's very much in the study. These demographic developments are serious. And it really increases, I think, the urgency of this. And it's exactly why there needs to be something between the current situation and, and full membership, if we accept that full membership is, is still somewhere away. Uh, Malinka, if I may add something to what Richard has said. Uh, first of all, there is a study of the University of Ljubljana uh, telling us in absolute terms how much money this would cost the Western European taxpayer, uh, the European Union taxpayer, if there was a significant increase of monies going to the Balkans, to the Western Balkans, the German taxpayer would have to pay 
10 euros per annum more than it's paying now to the budget. And for the smaller countries, it's something like 2 euros or stuff like this. But this is not the main point. The main point is, and I said it already, I think that we are beyond the point of no return in two fields. One is human capital. It's gone. I don't think that there is any way of, I, I, I don't know an example that people who have migrated have returned in great numbers at all. And the second one is environment. I think that these changes cannot be made different in the next 20 to 30 years. So what I think we all in doing study, doing research should look into is how to deal with this in the future. How are we going to deal with societies which are old and which are lacking more and more human power for simple things, for industrial labor, for, for hospitals, nurses? So this is the question I think that we should look into to be realistic. And the second one is, uh, is there a way to mitigate somehow the, the climate changes in the region? by doing swiftly a change in the energy sector and so on. These are really the burning issues. And just simply to continue repeating, okay, these countries have to reform faster so that one day they might become members of the European Union. I think that this is most counterproductive. It's frustrating people and it's really fueling right-wing populism and authoritarianism in the region. Uh, okay, thank you, Dushan, again for this intervention. Since we have five or more minutes, uh, I will ask uh, Silvana and Maya for their final observations. And of course, because Dushan, I think this was more or less your final ob observation. And if Richard wants to come back with the final comment, then I will uh, give the last word to him. So, Silvana, please. Looking uh, forward, yes. <laughs> um, the, the key issue was mentioned here several times, the demographic of the Balkans, and really the people are massively flowing out. Uh, last week there was an Aspen conference with, uh, in the framework of EU presidency devoted on the topic of migration. And it was greeted by all the participants and panelists. I was part of that conferences, conference and on our panel, we were also speaking about the possibilities for regional cooperation to stop the processes and so on. Actually, nobody used the term to stop the processes, but to turn the, uh, this uh, type of migration into so-called circular migration. So people would uh, come back to the region and go where they, they establish their lives and so on. It is very difficult to do that, but the main issue is uh, uh, statistics. Uh, in all of these countries, we have problem with data. Dushan mentioned some data, but that is data that is uh, derived from the uh, statistics of so-called recipient countries. So uh, we as countries that are uh, pushing our people away to be very brutal, Actually, we don't have the statistics uh, how many of them have left. And what is more important, what are the skills of these people uh, or uh, so-called in economic terms, human capital? Our human capital is melting. It's melting in absolute terms, but it's also melting in qualitative terms because many educated people are, are going abroad. And we could not do any proper economic planning in all these countries if we don't have this data. So doing censuses in all of these countries is crucial to gather this data. We, uh, unfortunately, the census has become political issue in all these countries, especially in, in our, uh, without uh, uh, having in mind what are the consequences of not knowing with what resources the country is actually uh, 
uh, the country has. The other issue is uh, a part of the environment. Uh, people uh, very much ask for a decent education system and health system and social systems. So many of them, even uh, if they have a good income here, we have a blooming of so-called IT industries in the region, including North Macedonia, where people have very decent income. They have better standard of living in economic terms, only in economic terms, uh, than if they move to Germany. But many of them decide to go because they say <clears throat> these uh, other parts of the society are not well developed. So when we are talking about the regional cooperation, I think that all these aspects needs to be taken into consideration. If uh, these countries want to promote themselves as a, a region, they have to promote uh, these qualities of living. And I don't want to be uh, pessimistic. And uh, I would say that even this investment of 9 billion of the EU, if it is done properly and uh, articulated in uh, uh, where it is needed, it could do a difference because people are tired of not seeing a difference. Uh, we are stuck in the process of integration for so long and we are, we are counting on that process. So uh, that needs to be changed. Unfortunately, I'm not seeing any positive changes lately. And that is a threat for the process and also a threat of the region losing more time. And then we, we, we are in a danger to come in a situation that would be very irreversible in terms of demographic as well in terms of further economic development of the region. Thank you. Thank you, Silvana. Maya, please. Thanks, thanks Mariko. I mean, not, not much from my side. I mean, I couldn't agree more on, on the urgency and primacy of the human capital aspects and, and the environment. And I can only hope that this sort of genuine commitment towards regional cooperation picks up, but also the serious approach on the side of EU towards uh, the economic integration uh, of, the, of the region. I can also uh, uh, hope that whatever we will continue to do on this common regional market translates into uh, concrete benefits for, uh, for uh, uh, the public. I also hope for a, for a positive Sofia summit, despite very very tricky context that we that, that we have uh, just a couple of days uh, ahead of the summit. And why I'm I'm, I'm mentioning not just because of this regional uh, economic cooperation agenda, but because at the summit we also expect the leaders to to take a regional commitment towards a green agenda in the region. And yes, it might be sort of declaratory, but it might be uh, 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 also a first step. Uh, uh, towards trying to, to, to translate it in, 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 uh, in practical work and, and commitment. So because of all these aspects, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to the best, uh, uh, I mean, to the best extent possible in the, in the current circumstances, uh, a good summit and, and, and a good signal of, of, of uh, continuing the work, both on the economic, uh, uh, in the economic uh, agenda, as well as on uh, environment and climate change. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Maya. Uh, Richard, would you like to have a final comment? Okay, yes. yeah, I can, yeah, thank you. Uh, I, well, I would just close by saying, you know, thank you very much to the other participants. I mean, this was a really very interesting debate. I actually have been making a lot of notes while you've been talking. And uh, as I said, we're already preparing a follow-up and uh, I'm going to steal some of your ideas. So, so, you know, maybe I can finish with one positive, you know, um, I think in every crisis there's opportunity and this, what we're living through now is a very serious crisis. But I think one thing with it, which it has done and which it will do, and we are living that today, is that it has moved a lot of the economy online and it has reduced the importance of geography and basically the proximity to the German core, which has been so dominant in Europe for decades. You know, It has, to some extent, in at least some parts of the economy, reduced the importance of geography and proximity to Germany. And maybe in that, maybe there is some opportunity for a region like the Western Balkans. Uh, thank you, uh, Richard, very much. Um, 
it we are on time i think that we managed to have a very fruitful debate um, within uh, our time limits i would very much like to thank uh, our presenter and our discussants for uh, their um, very constructive uh, in-depth and um, highly qualified inputs uh, on behalf of the European Policy Institute, I would very much welcome a follow-up to this discussion because we have seen that some issues are really burning. And if some trends are not reverted in the Balkans, it might have a long-term very negative effect, effect not only for the region, but also for the European Union. So. Uh, we would be very interested to be engaged in any um, uh, manner uh, in uh, discussions uh, or any initiatives that could follow up uh, to, to this study and looking in the options and prioritization uh, of issues uh, that would lead more to uh, more EU in the Balkans. Thank you all again. Thank, uh, thank you all participants in uh, this um, virtual panel discussion and I hope uh, we shall have uh, an opportunity to discuss, uh, to have another fruitful debate on the issues raised uh, in uh, future. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all.